Reporting for Heart Rhythm TV, I'm Meheg Dandy, and I'm joined by Dr. Isabel dyson Hoffa from German Heart Center in Mire. Welcome, Dr. dyson -Hoffa. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, we're coming off of the Innovation Late-Breaking Clinical Trial Session, where you presented the tailored AF study, AI-guided ablation mm -hmm. with persistent AF patients versus PVI alone. Could you tell us a little bit about the results, the key results of the study, and the main implications you see on clinical practice? Yeah, it was the first trial where we could really show that an AI-guided, EGM-driven ablation approach combined with a PVI was superior uh, regarding the freedom of front atrial fibrillation to a PVI only. And um, I think that um, the AI part of it was the most important in that whole thing because um, AI allowed us to adjudicate electrograms that we recorded during ongoing persistent atrial fibrillation um, to dispersion or no dispersion. And dispersion in a short term means that this is something that drives AFib, okay? So it's an area you would like to ablate. And um, then in the trial, we ablated these dispersed areas, uh, did an additional PVI, and could show then this was beneficial to the freedom from AF, but also in the longer term freedom from any atrial trachea arrhythmia. And how, sorry, yeah. go ahead. And, and what was very interesting, I think, is that and the most impressive results we could see were in patients with longer standing atrial fibrillation. So there was a pre-specified subgroup of patients with more than six months of duration of atrial fibrillation. And in this subgroup, the results are really, if you permit me to say that it was crashingly positive. So very impressive. That's really interesting. And the, the overall population with PVI alone also had a fairly high freedom yes. from yeah. AFib. And why, why might you think that is? I know we'll see more subsequent studies yeah. come out. Was there something about their substrate, something about their comorbidities? Was there a difference between the European and American centers, or might yeah. we see that down the line? Yeah, I, I think they are, they are, it's a combination of all of this, because um, we took care really, uh, at least for example in my center, to include more patients that had a longer duration for atrial fibrillation. And in the trial, we tried to exclude patients with um, short-lasting uh, persistent edge fibrillation. But of course, in the end, they sneaked in a little bit. And um, that was the one problem, I think. And the second one is um, that uh, we, uh, of course, improved our PVI technologies and techniques. And um, the PVI arm, as well as the other one, the ablations were done with RF, but with high power short duration. Uh, and really a wide encircling, a real waka, if you would say so, for the PVI arm. And, and that's uh, combined with the, uh, these uh, patients that are also included with, uh, who had a short-lasting uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. I think this combination of all of that uh, prompted this uh, high, surprisingly high success rates of PVI only um, in that group. But again, when you look at the longer lasting um, um, persistent atrial fibrillation patients, then we could reach barely 50% of success uh, with PVI only. So not something very satisfying. And I think very known to us by our clinical practice. Right, the long standing persistent AF outcomes definitely is what we yeah. struggle with. And that was quite yeah. consistent what we'd yeah. see in clinical practice. Now we, during the session, the question about the actual voltage mapping and, and posterior wall uh, yeah. questions did come up. In terms of the locations where yeah. where uh, the AI guided ablation hmm. uh, was not post, or at least anecdotally, anecdotally from what we know so far, was not yeah. necessarily always a posterior wall. Yeah. Does that also speak to the atriopathy uh, a little bit, or do you think that that's just something novel that we're seeing that maybe the posterior wall? I think it's it's. Um a little bit the, the depressing and the encouraging news is uh, the depressing about this is that this pragmatical approach of ablating somewhere, which is just an anatomical one size fits all procedure, is not really working. And uh, when we really look for the individual substrate and the individual driver of persistent atrial fibrillation, it's unfortunately it's not always in the same place. It's, it's not always on the posterior wall. It's not something like for the PVs where you could say, you know what, I, I, if I ablate PVs, if I isolate PVs, I'm never doing harm and I'm probably always doing a good thing, okay? But that's not true for other regions in the atrium, at least it seems after the study, 
but we have to, to do the cumbersome thing and to go back and look individually in each patient. So what's your substrate? Where is your driver located? What is driving your AFib? And the good news is you can do it AI driven. So it's relatively fast, it's objective, it's reproducible. And I think for me, the most fascinating thing in that whole trial was to see how reproducible the results were also among the centers, among operators. We had 26 centers, 51 operators, and still the results were extremely comparable among all these uh, persons. So I think that this AI provided objectivity that is, uh, I think, was uh, pivotal to the trial's result. Yeah, it's very valuable information, right? We talk about the role of AI in so many aspects of medicine now. Yeah. And it's nice to see a very clear indication, a very clear protocol and very clear results. Do you see us at some point in the future saying we're not going to do PBIs at all, regardless of how long the AFib duration is? I know. No, no, no. no. <laughs> that is something where, where, where we really learned maybe in, in trials before. And, and I mean, we participated also in Star F2. And I think this, this, this uh, dominant role of PVI only is, is so convincing. And we have such a bunch of data for this. And even in our trial. I mean, reaching in an intention to treat population 70% of success rate with PVI only, uh, albeit it might be a waka, uh, but still uh, tells you that no, this has to be the cornerstone of any AFib ablation. The, the question is then really, what do I add? And I'm a little bit skeptical about adding a posterior wall just because I can do it. Uh, you know, this is like, just because I can, that's maybe not a good strategy. Yeah. Right, because then uh, you, you could kind of extend that to any areas that are yeah. scarred. You could extend it to mitral yeah. lines or, yeah. you know, alcohol. You could do like pragmatical that. things and that will increase a little bit probably the success rate. But for example, for the posterior wall, and it's always astonishing me, it has never been shown. We have no evidence for it. And that might be the fault of the study designs that have been conducted. but. Uh, even if you look into into uh, meta-analysis, it's not positive. So, correct. And in terms of the technology used for the ablation itself, in addition to where do we ablate, there might be a question of how do we ablate with which exact RF versus cryo versus yep. PFA. Yep. Uh, do you think that there that this these results could hopefully potentially extend to different technologies yes, of delivery? Yes, I, I totally, I'm totally convinced because in fact, what you record with these multipolar uh, mapping catheters are distinct areas. Okay, so it's maybe a surface of uh, one centimeter square to two centimeters square that are dispersed. And the one centimeter you could get rid of with, with focal lesions maybe, but the two centimeter square is a little bit cumbersome. So we um, had a study protocol to encircle this and then connect this to some anatomic boundary. So imagine having a, a, a ferropose catheter there and just woof, getting rid of this. Uh, well, perfect. Uh, yes. Awesome. Excellent work. And, and uh, the, the presentation was wonderful. I, I had the opportunity thank to attend you. the whole session. So that was really nice. And thank you for your work, Dr. Jason Hoffa. And thank you for thank joining us today. Thank you. And to all our viewers, continue to follow Heart Rhythm TV on YouTube for exclusive coverage of the late-breaking clinical trials and for more content from HRS 2024.